I, I first met Frank in the dismembered Tennesseans, I guess, uh, back in the 70s, maybe the mid-70s. Uh, and I was... Uh, trying to get started in the music business and they were doing shows they were in the music business and it was mostly local type entertainment and we uh, we really weren't that competitive with each other or rather complimented each other in a way i mean i a lot of times they couldn't do something and i would they'd throw it out to me and sometimes i couldn't do something i'd throw it out to them and we kind of shared some work but we became friends and i was so fascinated with his uh, work on the microphone that he was such a, uh, he was so full of life and such a character. I, I just uh, was uh, mesmerized by his control on the microphone, how he could just take over a crowd and just all of a sudden everybody's paying attention to him, you know. And so many times when you're playing music, you start playing and people start talking and depending on what that venue is, they're, they're talking or drinking, they're having a good time, it's a party or whatever. But Frank could always overcome that and just cut right to the chase, and he would just have meat out of his hand in just a matter of a few uh, stories that he would tell at the microphone, and just his command of the microphone just amazed me, and I always just uh, admired him so much for that. And as a person, he was a really nice man. He was a nice person to me, always. Frank and I used to, uh, we'd hear, hear good stories, you know, and we, he'd pass them on to me and he'd tell me, you can't tell this within 50 miles of Chattanooga. He said, this is my material. And so I'd say, well, okay, and then I'd have a good joke and I'd tell him and I'd say, oh, you can't tell it within 50 miles of Chattanooga. And that was our little agreement. And one time he and uh, the dismembered Tennesseans were playing in Ringgold, Georgia at the train depot. And uh, they had been, evidently they had been riding Fletcher unmercifully about these Birkenstock shoes or some brand shoes that he had on that were a little bit different than what the normal footwear is, you know, for band members, you know, he came in with some Birkenstock sandals on or something and, and maybe some white socks, I don't remember. But anyway, when I walked up to them, they had just, they had just been doing unmerciful treatment of him about his shoes, I guess. And so when I walked up, I said, Fletcher, I said, how long did the doctor say you had to wear them shoes? And of course, Frank and the whole band just broke up because they, they had been digging him about it all day, I guess. And uh, so Frank said, oh, that's good, that's good. Oh, that's choice, that's choice. I said, well, Frank, you can't use that on stage today because I said, I, I may use that when I go on later on. I was going on after they did. And uh, so he said, okay, I won't. I'll use the 50-mile the rule. We won't, we won't tell that within 50 miles of Chattanooga. And he walked right out on the stage and they did their first number and he stepped up to the microphone and looked at Fletcher and he said, Fletcher, how long did the doctor tell you you had to wear them shoes? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I had asked Frank and uh, McDonald and Fletcher Bright to come and be guests on the Cowboy Jubilee radio show. And uh, Frank, uh, Fletcher was going to bring his fiddle and uh, Frank was with the ALS was incapacitated about playing the guitar. So he asked me to bring my guitar and said, you and Fletcher can do a tune or two or whatever. And I said, well, okay, we'll do that. But I said, I need to get you there at two o'clock. You know, I have a technician there that works at uh, WSMC and uh, he will need to, these the students and they have classes, so I wanted them to be on time. So anyway, I kept waiting for him and I, about 10 or 15 minutes went by two o'clock and, and uh, of course Fletcher had taken on the role of Frank's chauffeur and had the little chauffeur's hat and he'd go get the van and go pick Fletcher up anytime he needed to ride. But he and such a good friend that he had in Fletcher Wright. It, uh, it was great that he would go and pick him up anywhere he wanted to go. So they were about 15 minutes late, but I, so I went outside the radio station and I looked and I saw the van and I could see Fletcher in there with the little hat on and I could see Frank through the back window and they would go down past the radio station and went down by Little Debbie on Little Debbie Parkway there in Absent and they go down that way and then I'd see them come back and about 10 minutes ago by and I guess they were trying to get directions and they came back again and then again one more time about three times and along about 2.30 I called them and said, hey, where are you guys at? They said, well, we're trying to find the place. They said, we think we know where it is. I said, well, you've passed me about three or four times. And I said, I'm up on the hill up here. So finally they came back, came in the radio station. And of course, Frank was in this wheelchair apparatus in the back compartment of the van. And Fletcher gets out of the van with his little hat on and runs around and opens the door up, slides it open for Frank. And Frank immediately says, well, he said, I tried to tell my chauffeur friend here that it's got to be the building with all the antennas on it, but he, he wouldn't stop. He wanted to, he, he was still looking around. But he, but anyway, he, he, it was funny, they, they were at each other all the time and kidding around with each other and, and just as best of friends. But it was so funny that he, uh, he, he I tried to tell him, you know, it had to be the building with all the antennas on it. So that was a funny little story that I had. And when we got on the air, we told that story. So it was funny. And, and they came and, you know, Frank was such a good, he was so good on the microphone. I think the day that they were my guests, I normally play 14 to 15 songs during the program. I think 
that day, we probably didn't play five songs the whole day. We played a little Western Swing to kick it off, and then we got right into some conversation, and Fletcher played a couple of fiddle tunes, and that was it. But Frank carried the show just about the whole time with his uh, uh, funny stories and his uh, command of the microphone. He was just great at it. It really was. I think it's kind of how they got in the newspaper business was print material for the, the the home stores maybe is how that came down. I don't really know, but I, he was uh, he was active in the music business and working for the paper when I sort of gotten to know him there. And uh, I remember the first time I ever saw Frank McDonald was uh, they were playing at the Chattanooga Choo Choo, and I think they were playing for the Tennessee Municipal League, which is uh, mayors from all the cities across Tennessee. And of course, there's a lot of, a lot of vanity in the room. I guess with all those mayors there, you know, and a lot of important people, and uh, there's a lot of talking going on. And I tell you what, Frank came out there and hit the stage. And before he did, though, I noticed he had a little briefcase, and in this briefcase was a sport coat, and it was a kind of coat that you need to hang on a hanger. I mean, it would. I don't know what the material was. It may have been a cotton sport coat. I don't know, but he had it all wadded up and turned inside out, and just had mashed it all to pieces and put it in this briefcase and shut the lid. Well, that was a, one of his props that he used was that old sport coat. And he took that sport coat out of that briefcase and just kind of shook it out and put it on. And he looked like that he had been riding on a, a Greyhound bus all day and had just got off the bus is what he looked. I mean, he had that, that was his appearance. And uh, uh, he walked out on the stage there with all the conversation going on and everything. They had a nice introduction, but still there was conversation. and and glasses rattling and dishes and stuff. And uh, within five minutes, he had complete command of that group and he had them rolling in the aisles. And that was one of the first times that I ever saw him. And I said, boy, I wish I was as good as that guy. You know, I have to learn something from him. I'll watch him and see what he does. And I'll try to do those things. But I never did quite master it the way he did, but I learned a lot from him, uh, really, uh, in stage presence and, uh, and working on the microphone. I think maybe the, the way they got started uh, with the dismembered Tennesseans group was, and I'm sure Fletcher Bright can give you more lowdown on this than I can, but they were all students at Macaulay School, and they, I think, had a talent show or played at a program at some time at the school, and it just all snowballed from there. They got together and rehearsed for that show, and uh, 
Fletcher will have to tell you more about the name Dismembered Tennesseans, but I think there was a, a band on the Grand Ole Opry, as I remember, was called Lost John and the, and the Kentuckians or something like that, and uh, uh, United Kentuckians, and they were going to be the Dismembered Tennesseans uh, just as a fluke on uh, the United Kentuckians band. I think that's the way it went, but anyway, it was something like that, but it was an unusual name that they had for a band, and uh, probably he's answered that question a million times, you know, where that came from, but I think I've heard that story at some time down through the years that it was kind of a, a spinoff of, of something that was going on on the Grand Ole Opry, and they were a group called Lost John and the United Kentuckians, maybe, and then they said, well, we'll just be the Dismembered Tennesseans, and that's how they started that, that name and that band, I believe. And Fletcher Bright will correct me on that, I'm sure, if... if if he sees this and it's not correct, he'll he'll ask for a he'll ask for time to c come on the air and uh, correct this uh, story. But that's what what I remember was that story. That sounded better yeah. as he broke the string, don't you think? Well, thank you so much, there, friends, and uh, for those of you out in the radio audience who don't have an opportunity to see tonight, we always like radio audiences because we don't have to look all that good when we get up here. I have just broken the string on the old guitar, but uh, it doesn't take long to get geared back up. Yeah, here you be tuning that thing for me. I, I don't want the people out in the radio audience to have to listen to that thing wind up. It hurts your teeth there, and I think we could spare them with that. Uh, there, the Peter Jennings show, we, uh, we did. We played our hearts out for it. We did some of the greatest songs that I thought we'd ever done. And then when it came on TV, the only thing they had of us was a shot of us jumping up in the air, which I felt like was sort of not quite what we had in mind and certainly not what we wanted to be discovered doing. I did get one telephone call out of the whole mess, and uh, it was from a creditor who said he had not understood that I was doing so well and thought maybe now was time for us to talk. <laughs> but here we are, we're back again, and we have with us uh, Fletcher Bright, who is going to sing the lead on this next song. I don't know how many of you would have guessed it, but there is not a single member of this band up here who has had any formal vocal training. I think of the whole band, though, probably uh, Fletcher Bright has had the least vocal training of any of us. And he is going to come up here and demonstrate how someone with seemingly no talent at all can get up in front of a microphone, and if you just turn it up loud enough, it'll sound passable. We're going to do one that uh, Fletcher's going to sing the leads to. It's that old favorite uh, entitled The Rank Stranger. They, they were forever uh, on stage making fun of one another, and, and Frank, of course, being the uh, doing the MC work, he got to make fun of everybody. They, you know, probably said very little about him, but he he had the opportunity to, to cut them all down to size, and he worked on Ed Cullis all the time because Ed was short. You know, he was probably the, the shortest musician in the in the in the town, and they were. At one time, I remember he was talking about getting him a Coca-Cola. A flat to stand on so he'd be up even <laughs> with the rest of the band. <laughs> but he, they were forever uh, uh, kidding each other and he always said that uh, Ansley Moses was the only musician on the American stage that was completely tone deaf and could not hear a thing. <laughs> but, and then Fletcher, he, 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 he ridiculed Fletcher about the, and I remember when this took place, it was called, the, I think the Southern States uh, Fiddle Championship of the whole Southern United States Fiddle Championship, and it was held at Raccoon Mountain over around Lookout Mountain. And the day of that festival, I went down there, and it was raining so hard, everybody got stuck, and most everybody left. And uh, Fletcher uh, wound up being the Southeastern United States Fiddle Champion. And Frank always said it was by virtue of just the grace of God and the fact that there were all the fiddle players left except Fletcher and, and one or two more guys, and that's all that was there. So Fletcher was better than the two of them. So he got the uh, uh, Southern States uh, 
fiddle championship. Uh, I do want to introduce real quickly the band to you down on the far end is none other than the Southern States fiddle champion, the fellow who, but for the grace of God and two pretty sorry fiddle players would have come in dead last at the fiddle championship down at Lake Lanier only two years ago, but uh, more recently is the Dunlap Coke Ovens fiddle champion, Fletcher Bright. That's not necessary. That's not necessary. None of our other crowds applauds at that point, and I don't know why we ought to expect you to. He's, uh, as I told you before, since uh, winning the Southern States Fiddle Champion back in the early 70s on a cold and rainy day down at Crystal Cave in Alabama, why he's uh, been through a whole series of uh, fiddle championships and uh, uh, quite disappointing, I might add. Uh, and until uh, the Coke Ovens Championship here about uh, three or four months ago, uh, he had uh, been served up an unusual dose of humility by uh, fiddle judges all over this part of the country. And so uh, most people would have thrown their fiddle away by now, but not Fletcher Bright. Standing on my immediate right in that bright red shirt is the only legally deaf entertainer on the American stage today. Our lead singer, the mayor of the town of Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, Mayor His Honor, the Mayor Mose Moses. Uh, my name is Frank McDonald, and I'm wearing a brand new hat. It was given to me out of appreciation by this band only at Christmas time. I don't know how good a hat it is. Uh, and I won't know until they get it out in a good hard rain sometimes and see how the thing holds up. But uh, so far, seems like a pretty good hat, and I'm deeply indebted to the band for their expression of confidence here. I do most of the talking, and uh, I'm sorry about that, but you'd be hearing a lot more music otherwise. Uh, got little Doc Cullis, the shortest five-string banjo player here tonight, I'm sure. Uh, Doc... Uh, Hard for the folks out in Radio Land to appreciate how short Doc is. So we we keep Doc around, figuring that if it ever gets to where he can't play his banjo any anymore, we'll give him a flat top haircut and use him for a coffee table. I think he did a lot of things for the community as well as the band that was always doing a, a benefit show for some charity, and they were constantly doing good works and. Um, of course, that always goes a long way, you know. I mean, when you're in that kind of business, it, it helps it helps you get additional work, but it, it's also you're doing something to help somebody else. And he did a lot of that. And, uh, and Fletcher still does, too. Fletcher does it, too. But uh, they just had a, uh, they had a wonderful uh, camaraderie amongst them, and they just uh, stayed together for so long just because they enjoyed each other as as persons, and even though they seemed like they'd get on the stage and be digging at each other about stuff, they were really just doing it in fun, and and that's what I think the audience picked up on the fact that it, this was all. These guys are just having a good time. They're just having a good time, and they want us to have a good time. I liked him, and it's a, he was a very likable person, and he was. A, I use the term loosely, I guess, but he was a character. He was just one of these people you meet in life that <laughs> he was just a character. You know, and uh, people like to talk to him. And uh, I used to go down and, and visit with him at the Free Press, and especially after he uh, had the uh, started with the ALS. Uh, and he he always, uh, and I never thought about it at the time, but he had asked me, would I scratch his back, or scratch his neck, or somewhere that he couldn't reach? He he, he was itching. He wanted to well, if you could scratch his scratch my shoulder for me right there. If you can do that for me, he said I. I'll, I'll buy you lunch one day. <laughs> but he was just that kind of person. He's somebody you like to stop and see and talk to and always, uh, I would say regardless of the situation he was in, he was always upbeat. I mean, he, he, he made you feel good when you left, you know. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not surprised that, uh, that uh, this, this many years later that he still, people think a lot of him. 
Well, thank you so much there, friends and neighbors. Thank you so much. And as that fine applause slowly dies away, I got to admit that there are people running for president of the United States of America today with a whole lot less encouragement than you've just given us. And I want you to know that from the bottom of our hearts, we appreciate it.